to speak to an audience. It's even uh, less likely that you're going to have two archivists in a room at one stage. So today is an interesting day because it's a collaboration between the University of New England and the University of Newcastle. Uh, through the auspices of Richard, we have gained a set of records. The importance of these records is immediately identified by the uh, academics at the University of Newcastle who passionately requested that they be digitised and sent down in a format so that they could do some study. Over to uh, Richard Belfield in a short while who holds the interesting um, position of being a donor of records rather than being an academic who studied the records. But luckily, uh, Professor Howard Bridgman, who's come up from the University of Newcastle to speak shortly on the significance of the records, but really uh, what I'm here to do is to, to promote the importance of checking out the historic records that your family have, that your community has, and making sure that things that have got great age that are sitting out there are actually looked at and, and uh, could actually make their way into the public domain, either by direct donation into an archive or through the medium of electronic transfer, such as we've done in this case. So um, you may want to ask about weather, you may want to ask about Algernon Belfield, the man who created these records, or you may want to ask about digitisation of electronic records. Whichever one you want to think uh, to talk about, ask us at the end. And uh, one of the three of us that are here will uh, attempt to answer your questions before lunch. Thank you very much and I'll hand over now to Richard Belfield to talk about the man who created the records. It's great pride. We're here to recognise a man's great love of weather and his contribution, I hope, to the weather world of tomorrow and even today. And I think it's... Um, I'm very proud to be representing him because it's a shame he couldn't be here to do it himself. <laughs> to get on with it, Algernon Henry Belfield was born in Fulham, London. He was the fifth son of his family. His father's Thomas D and Mr Thomas Daniel. They had a great control of the sugar industry in Barbados and the sugar, as you know, in that era was a luxury and obviously a very fruitful enterprise. His schooling in 1851 was firstly at Pencarwick in, um, oh dear oh me, uh, in, in Devon, a very exclusive school uh, for those of southern England. And he was there, and then he went from there <coughs> where he finished his schooling at rugby. And at rugby, he mastered both Greek and Latin, which he could read fluently, so we can imagine he may have spoken it as well. But he was a, a scholar. And then, of course, uh, what happened just before his 17th birthday, he stepped off a boat in Newcastle a, a fortnight before his 17th birthday, came to New England, where he commenced work as a jackaroo, and he worked on Boralong. He worked on Malpas and then he subsequently uh, became uh, in the position to take up land uh, out of Deversley, which he built upon, and he ultimately built that into about a 20,000 acre <coughs> property. <coughs> but where he was very proud of the fact that he ran 19,000 sheep on that. So, on the 19th, 1873, he married Emma Jane Husband in Sydney, and they then had uh, their, their own family, of eight children, four boys and four girls. One girl died uh, as a child. In 1874, the Eversley Observatory, attended by Mrs. Belfield and Park, was actually there, and it, they observed the transit of Venus, which at that time was a very special event because it was the northernmost area in New South Wales, and the uh, Government astronomer even came up to have a look at Mr. Belfield's uh, equipment, which he was very pleased with. Now, in 1877 to 1922, he took it upon himself to keep these meticulous weather records that we're here talking about today and, and honouring his work. I am told by Howard and other academics these are something quite special. Now, it's to be hoped that these eventually become something of value to the world of weather. 
So he did every morning at nine o'clock. The old man said he did not go near him at five to nine because he knew where he was going. He'd go to do his weather. And every morning at nine o'clock he did ten different things every day. Now obviously he got others to do it. And as his records progress, they get even better. They're beautiful records. They're one of them you could look at after. So that was one of his great passions, was the weather. There is no shadow of a doubt. This man loved the weather. And I don't think he ever thought in his wildest dreams that he would have had us here talking about them today because he left a very, very meticulous will, this man. And there's no mention at all about these records of what he would have done with them like that. So we're lucky that we've found them. And this one, that, that document that's here today, I found in November. So it just shows, you know, there are idiots, but they're mine. But he was also, he had, other, he had a passion for learning and education overflowed in him where he put 45 pounds of his own money together to build a school at Eversley for his people. Not his boys, because they were all teenagers at this point, but he decided that these kids, and they had 23 children there at one stage, off and around the area, that Algernon built the school for. So he then went on, of course, uh, <laughs> to carry on in, in this passion for learning. 1894, he was one of the first directors and shareholders in the building of the Armadale School. We have a copy of the original share certificate. He was also, th these are some of the things that he did, which I think I know. He was a director and honorary treasurer of the Armadale PP board for 40 years. He, with Mr. E.G. Bloomfield, was appointed head superintendent and controlled the expenditure of all road monies allocated by government to their particular district. We need him back. <laughs> he was a very well known in the scientific world. Now, this is the Armadale Chronicle of 1922. He was a member of the Royal Society, still a prestigious society, and he was a member there up until 1920 that we can find. He was a member of the British Astronomical Association, New South Wales affiliate. Algernon had a road in our federal capital, Canberra, named after him, the son of the Flory that carries the name of Algernon Belfield Crescent. Um, he was a member of the Australian Association for the Advancement of Science. And of course, this weather activity, which I haven't told you, that carried on the last wherever it is, um, entry in there is in the 2nd of July, 1922. Algernon left us on the 5th of August, so he virtually went right up to the end of his life in his love of this weather. And um, you can see the quality of his work, the only one, so I'll have a look at it. So, there we go. Um, and of course, in 1902, he built Eversley to 20,000 acres. So he was a farmer, but he was also a researcher, and he was some sort of a scientist. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Now, he also took a great interest in livestock with diseases and all that and became somewhat of an expert. Now, he was a devout member of the Anglican Church, involved with the Dyson Council for many years, regular worshipper and lay reader at Sunday services, once a month at Somers Ponds, St. Nicholas Church, that little church there, Somers Ponds. This was a buggy trip of 12 miles, so you know, that, he did that every month. Now, his one of the things that I found fascinating, which is not here today, is his private scrapbook, because it really gives me an insight into the man. Really, you can look at what he was interested in. He loved poetry. He, there's a whole plethora of information in there that took his interest. I haven't had the, the hide to stick it. There's a lot of loose material. I've never tried to stick it in, because it's a document in progress, and it still belongs to him. OK, he had some very passionate beliefs. He, one of his things is, is his word. He had a fetish about the word. If a man said so, why would he do otherwise? Imagine if we did that in this day and age. Just try it. <laughs> Breaking of one's word without ironclad reason and remorseful regret invokes somewhere near the earthly equivalent of the extreme wrath of our God. Now, there you go. Apparently, he was something else if you let him down. Now, his wife, Emma, died in 1970, so he was made a widow, and he died, of course, in 1922. And, and I think this is lovely. Returning from a weekly ritual of his little terrier dog in a horse and sulky, Algernon was feeling a little weary. This is on the 2nd of August. Of collecting the mail at Jamaica Railway Station on Wednesday, the 2nd of August. Right, right, arriving home, retired to his room. And of course, as I said, where he died, obviously, on Saturday the 5th, was buried on, on the 6th. Work went on as normal on Monday. 
Um, we've presented these archives in the hope and belief that they will further science, that they will further the benefit of mankind. I hope they are as valuable as we need to believe. I hope they bear the fruit that we would like them to be, and that it might be best interest talking there. But these records, Martin Babakin, who can't be here today, said to me, hey, Richard, these have gone round the world faster than anything that I could have dreamt of. Now, we gave them to Newcastle Uni on the 9th of March last. They have circled the world. They have found their way into the National Archive, as Martin Babakin said, that's very important, because anyone looking for material goes straight to the National Archive. They're in the White House, believe it or not. That will be political reasons, probably. They're also at the University of Exeter, which is a world climate institution, and they're looking at historical weather. But if you go into Google, and there's hours of reading there, they've gone all around the world. So, and you listen to Howard here, that the work hasn't started. Howard wants someone here to do research, and he'll tell you more about that than me. So, this is our formal uh, thanking the university for recognising you. I'm very proud to be here. A couple of people we must thank. Henry Belfield, my cousin, the last baby born Buller member, entrusted me with this material. And I'm very proud of that. I said to Henry before he died, well, that stuff up there, can I have that? He said, yep. Now, I didn't know what the content was. I had no idea. So Henry there, and then there's another bloke who we've used, and I think this is quite lovely. Lieutenant General Sir Herbert Eversley Belfield, God bless him, he wrote a book for us, the Belfield family. KCB, KCMG, KBE and DSO, and was a grand officer of the Belgian Order of the Crown. Well, that's still on that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm running out of time. Howard, I think, has a better story to tell than me. <laughs> I'm but the humble message. I charge this group to neither squander or misuse this information for either political or personal gain. I crave it be solely studied and understood for the betterment and future for an inquiring and more enlightened mankind. It would be truly wonderful if these documents contribute to unravelling just some of the many mysteries of our exceedingly complex world climate. Finally, May the dogged determination and diligent efforts of one very wise old man be a bountiful fruit for our collective future from his lifelong pursuit of learning and accrual of detailed knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And I particularly would like to take, uh, thank Richard for inviting me to come up and give this little presentation. It's quite an exciting uh, concept in terms of what's going on here. And I also want to acknowledge Jack Hobbs, who was my colleague at, here as a climatologist at New England for many, many years, with whom I've written at least a book and a few other things like that. And I'm very pleased to see him in the audience. Uh, and Aldrin Belfield. And what he's given is there's actually two data sets. Uh, there's a 1877 and 1904. The second book is, uh, is the uh, 1908 and 1992 data set. So 1922, so we've got 40 years, about 40 years of weather records, meticulously kept every day at 9 o'clock in the morning, including not only just the normal data that you collect, temperature, humidity, etc., but notes about what's going on in the atmosphere. Um, so very, very meticulous, very, very, very interesting. Um, now, in doing this, I had to get used to the old units. Okay? We don't deal with metrics in this kind of data set. I had to get used to things like inches of rain again, and, it, and inches associated with pressure in the barometer. By the way, if anybody has any idea where his barometer is, original barometer, not only would it be worth a bit of money, it would be certainly a wonderful archive to give for, uh, to the University of New England. As a, as a memento for this data set. Um, and basically all recorded in data books like this, that's for 1892, or like this. Now I'm going to extend Bill's plea. This cannot be the only data set that's available from the New England Plateau. It cannot be. Basically these books are set up, literally set up, so that the farmers and the people on the land can keep their weather records, okay? And as you'll see in a minute, I'll show you what that looks like. 
But the point is, the point is that some of you, perhaps not knowing, may have some of these records stored away in shearing sheds or packed away in little corners somewhere in your houses or whatever from your parents or grandparents, okay? And even great-grandparents, depending on the circumstances. Please, please look for them, okay? Particularly if you know somebody in your family has had some interest in the weather or you've taken weather re records from for, for purposes on the, on the land. Uh, these data sets are critical, and I'll explain why at the end. Okay, uh, now go back a bit, okay? Go back one. Okay. You see that? <laughs> yeah, up, up. There you go, okay? So basically, these books are set up for farmers and other uh, observers to use. Uh, there's a very clear layout for weather observations in terms of the setup. Each double page covers one month. And the older rec records are the, the formats a bit different. The <coughs> new double page starts one month. There's room for comments and summaries uh, and in the in the weather record. And Algeron was very very good at putting comments and summaries in. And then I had the question of Richard: Where did he actually house the meteorological measuring equipment? And I know the answer to that. He actually did use Stevenson screen at least toward the end. Because the Stevenson screen was invented, that's the little white box you see in any weather station that has slat, lat, not slats in it, okay? Allows the airflow through and it, it keeps the shade, keeps the instrument shaded. Well, that was invented in the mid 1800s by, by Thomas Stevenson. Okay, now, so this is, I hope you can see this okay. This is what the weather of uh, the book looks like. Uh, and some of it's pretty obvious. You've got on the left hand side temperatures. Uh, you've got um, uh, moisture and rainfall down below. You've got a barometer, a dry bulb, a wet bulb temperature. You have an estimate of uh, dew point temperature, okay? Um, and you have maximum and minimum temperatures. These are all records that the Bureau of Meteorology people keep today, all right? Uh, an estimate of what the wind direction is by observation. And then the wind speed is by force. And force, I think, comes from... Uh, estimating things like how fast, how, how much of the tree is bending in the wind, um, or is a gale blowing the, the slats off your house roof, or something like that, okay? So uh, that's all part of that, and then he keeps his own records too, he does summaries at the end of the month, so he says, how many days do we have rain? How many, da how many days was it, was it really windy? Um, what's the average temperature for the month? What's the uh, maximum temperature for the month? This is all material that he kept himself, okay? Um, uh, and uh, what's, he's kept cloud cover, too. What percentage of the sky was, was covered with clouds? Not cloud type, but cloud cover. Um, okay. Here's a later set, which is actually in this book. And basically, it's the same concept. Again, perhaps a little bit hard for you to see. But the day is on the left-hand side, and then all the records are there. Now, in my experience now, as a... As, as in terms of using weather data. This is the equivalent of a spreadsheet. How many of you deal with spreadsheets? Not too many, some of you, okay. So this is equivalent of a spreadsheet. And one of the things that has to happen is while this has been digitized, and we have it in a, a PDF or JPEG type file, it needs to be transferred into a spreadsheet if we're actually going to be using the data. So that's one of the first big challenges and that's what Bill and Johnny, who's from our, our, our archives, are working on now, using uh, advanced software, I think a mathematician is working on this, to try to get this all transferred into a spreadsheet. Because then we can use uh, software from the spreadsheet to do calculations in terms of the analysis. So that's the first big challenge. Okay, next. So here is notes, basically similar to what I just mentioned to you earlier. Um, uh, and as they, as they said, this is all online if you're interested. Okay. Now, how can we use this information? Um, this is a valuable addition to other similar data sets of this period. There's a man named Neville Nichols, who uh, Jack and I both know, who used to work at the Bureau of Meteorology Research Center. He's now a conjoint at Monash. And he spent a good deal of his working life working on historical data sets like this and putting them into some sort of structure that other people can use, okay? 
So this is a valuable addition to other similar data sets. And I dare say that this data set is better in terms of quality than just about all the other data sets that originated. Okay? Um, you can use this information along with other information, other climate information, to assess the actual climate and structure of the, for this area uh, compared to past or recent periods. One of the big concerns, for example, is are human beings affecting climate change? Well, this, this is a data set that's not really affected by human beings in terms of the concepts of what we know as climate change and human impacts right now. So this would provide good background information for comparison purposes compared to today, today's data set, for example. Um, you can use this data set for analysis of periods of severe weather, frequencies of severe weather, how often do big storms appear. And as, we, as I mentioned to Jack and I were talking about earlier, and also with the reporters, we can use it to evaluate the impacts of El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, associated with plateau conditions here. Okay? Um, but, as I mentioned, for, for particular proper statistical analysis, the data needs to be digitized. The second big challenge, we need somebody, or some buddies, hopefully, interested in working with the data. Um, the archivists are cock a hoop because they've got the data to put into the archives. They're not scientists. They don't know how to really work with the data. We need climatologists. Now, Jack retired from UNE. He wasn't replaced as climatologist. No, there are no climatologists at UNE at all and have not been for a decade? More than, that. More than a decade. Okay? In Newcastle, we have climatologists, but they're all hydrologists. They're interested in water and not so interested in this kind of data set. I've got a challenge for all of you to think about. You could, as a group, organize yourselves and approach the University of New England, or if they're not interested, approach the University of Newcastle, <laughs> with some money. If we could find 10 or 12 people who are willing to donate, say, $10,000 a year for five years, for a specified position at this university to work on these climate data sets, to organize them, to do analysis, to publish papers, to publish reports. Not only that, to actually resurrect the teaching of climatology, which means that they would get students to work on these data sets as well. You need about $100,000 a year to pay for salary plus on costs. Think about it. That's my challenge to you. Okay? Um, the, um, what was the third one? Those are the two main ones. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, okay? I've forgotten the third one, I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. But those are the two main ones I mentioned. Uh, but, and I don't want to go, I'm only supposed to talk for 10 minutes, so I've done about that. So uh, please be, I'm happy to answer questions as well as, uh, as, well as the others. And I'm, as I say, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you very, very much.